Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. How you doing, man? Um, Andrew, Andrew, I serve on his board of directors as um, one of the directors, I guess, on, on the board of As One Ministries. But before we go into our conversation, um, I think I was sharing with you a little bit this morning that my experience in Uganda was a little different than the average person that goes there. We were talking about that a little bit. So what I want to do is I want to begin with um, just sharing you all with you all a few pictures to kind of level set. And what I mean by level set is to get you exposed to um, the culture in Uganda so you can get a feel of some of the cultural differences. It's a little different than what we have here in America. You guys all right with that? A little different. So I just want to kind of expose you, and then we will go into our conversation as, as one. So I have pictures that I want to share. So tech team, if we can put the first picture up there, we can kind of talk through some things, and I will talk through. Uh, oh, that's not uh, oriented well, but it's okay. This is a picture of when we got there, uh, me with some of the kids, and what we're doing is staying at the compound. And we can talk about that in a little while that you built in Uganda. Next picture. We just got to move fast. You can get a, get a feel. This is church. Y'all feel that already? Yeah, that's church. This is what we would call, this is what they call here, Andrew, in the Baptist church, the choir processional. Y'all see that? Y'all know that, right? Y'all know the choir processional. Those of you that came from Baptist churches, you get a feel of what that is. Can y'all imagine marking down the aisle like that? The pastor would vote y'all out. Amen. But you get a feel of, of... And while we're talking about that, this church, just so we can say real quick, this is something you built, or your organization helped build? Help construct. Okay, so we'll talk about that, yeah. I want y'all to notice the call and response. Notice that? Amen. Good. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. Let's go to the next one. I want to give you a feel. This is worship. Isn't that? It's actually praise. This is my con. Yeah. This is my con. Yeah, so they, they actually call this praise. There's a, there's a very uh, big difference between praise and worship. This would be considered praise. Okay, nice. So this is where I was getting my groove on. Yeah. And notice how all the kids are involved, right? All the kids are involved. All the adults are involved. And it's just a great time. Are they rotating worship leaders or? Ah, whoever feels the spirit led. Okay, good. This is a little funny. Uh, if you can bring this down. Next slide. Go to the next slide. I just want to walk through. Now, I need you to explain this to our congregation. Do you know what happened here? Were you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, explain this. So, so he's auctioning off. There was a widow in the church that donated bananas uh, as, as her tithe. And now he's auctioning off those bananas. Uh, and, and so there was a, a high bidder that day. And, and then the money goes to the church as a tithe. But there'll be a lot of people who, who give their produce because they don't have an income. Yeah. Uh, they're subsistence farmers. And so they'll, they'll give their produce and, yeah. and they'll auction it off. Yeah. So if we were in America, people would give their Cadillacs and stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> BMWs. And, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Most churches wouldn't auction off nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Next slide. Go to the next one. Yeah. Now, can we turn the volume up on this? I want people to hear this because we'll talk about this in a little while. School on it. You get a feel. Kids walk three, four hours to get to school. There's a school getting built. This is the transportation we use to come here. So we have to ride three deep on these motorcycles to come. That's our mode of transportation as you're going through the village. Fun, yeah. fun, fun. 
scary but fun. Property that the school bought. So what you just saw was a school that's being built by Aswan Ministries. And Andrew just said to me, the building's already done, and they're on to something else. Yeah, they're, they're actually roofing that one now, oh, wow. and we're be, we've already begun the foundation of another building. Okay, good. Yeah. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that in a little while. Okay, next one. Go to the next one. Yeah. This is some of the people. I, this is what my, my interpretation. These are some of the kids in that neighborhood that's going to grow up in school. Yeah. Yeah, good, yeah. good. Isn't that something? Yeah, because here's what, we'll talk about this in a little while. Some of these kids have to walk for hours to get to school. So one of the things you're trying to do is to bring schools into the local community so they don't have to walk that far. Yeah. Okay, good. Next slide. Go to the next one. Yeah, next slide. So it is like kind of a culture. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and, pause that. Uh, Men. Pause, pause that. Okay, can you back that up? Ladies, do not get offended. I need you to listen. Okay. Yes. So it is like yeah. kind of a culture. Yeah. yeah. When uh, uh, men... Gets like in chairs, yeah. then ladies so egalitarian. Sit down. As you see here, like the, uh, yeah. right. women um, have yes. sat. The, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. Men the are view up. of marriage. I think so it's a sign of respect, uh, respecting Bible, men. Use <laughs> <laughs> so men domin uh, yeah. dominate. Yeah. Yeah, the oh, women. Wow. Here's okay. what here's what he was saying. That's Alan, right? Here's what Alan was saying. In the Ugandan culture, in majority culture, the women, when they enter a room where the man is, they sit on the floor, and the men sit on chairs. See, see, look. Yeah. When I walked into that village, here's how they greeted me. And tell them I'm not kidding. The ladies would walk up to me and they bow their heads. I said I need to bring them to RCF so we can try to. <laughs> yeah, I told you this. So way. I actually, I like to greet women that way. Oh, do you? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the culture. It's the most interesting thing yeah. that, um, and it seems like the higher you're up in authority, the women do the same thing. They bow before you, and if you're in the same room with a woman, she's on the floor. And you're on the chair as a man. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting. Go to the now. Listen to this next slide. Go to the next slide. Here, if you are to marry, yeah. to get a woman uh -huh. or a wife, yeah. you just prepare yourself by you wait, by. I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm going to just be. Okay. By, the, by, cause the, the family of the woman or the wife, yeah. they ask you for a dowry. What we call it, dowry. A dowry. Cows. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe cows. Maybe money. Wow. But big. They Explain are, wow. how many. Yes. Like it depends on the value of the woman you're taking. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So when the woman is like educated. Yeah. They can ask you like five cows. Oh wow! <laughs> what five. is minimum? The minimum, okay, two. Okay, two wow. Cows, yes, two. So this is like twenty cows. <laughs> oh, that one, <laughs> twenty yes. automatically. <laughs> wow, yes. that's Educated. deep. Educated woman. Yeah, that's deep. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's interesting. That and this is all over Uganda. Uh huh. It's the culture. The culture Uganda and some neighboring countries, Rwanda. Still today. Mm -hmm. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that's um. We can pass that. The, the concept of the dowry, I thought that was very interesting, that it still exists today. This young man was single because he didn't have enough money to buy a cow or cows to offer somebody to get their woman. So I told him I'd help him raise money to buy a cow. You didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but isn't that interesting? And the more educated you are, the more up the food chains you are, the more the dowry is for them to get you. Very, very interesting. Let me see if there's any more that we're going to talk real quick, Andrew. Any, go to the next one. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just give you a quick picture of this is village life. This is not city life. You get a feel of the mud huts that some of the and the locals live in and the agricultural nature of um, their lifestyle. Go to the next one so you can get a feel. And we had a chance to go inside of one of them. I want to give you just a quick picture of what it, you can put the audio down, I'll narrate, um, of what the inside of this um, residence look like. And um, you see how tight that is, right? And how compact that is. 
And look at the roof for when it rains. Yeah, you get it. That small room and how compact they are. And just think of us in American life trying to live like that. Lord, help us. Amen? Amen. Some of y'all sitting out just saying, bless them, bless them, bless them. Amen. Okay, we can stop. Okay, good. You can pause. I just want to give you a feel. So, Andrew, I have a couple of questions for you. Um, my testimony is I came to Christ as a result of um, a missionary coming to the place where I grew up and sharing the gospel with me, and I came to faith in Christ. So for me, missions is very, very, very important because had it not been for somebody taking missions seriously, I would not have a relationship with God. So tell us who is Andrew Devaney, and this is an important question. How old is Andrew, and what motivates Andrew to missions? Yeah, yeah so uh, I'm, I'm 25 years old, actually. Yeah, I turned 26 next month. He's a baby, uh, isn't he? Just a baby. Yeah. Year into marriage, I uh, have a beautiful wife named Veronica. I'm, a, I'm originally from South Dakota, maybe the first person you've ever seen from South Dakota. So we do <laughs> exist. We do exist. Um, yeah, and when I was in college, I beca became particularly um, concerned and interested in you know, material poverty, and, and I, I had a growing concern for the fact that I, I thought that Scripture was really, really, um, had a lot to say about poverty and the world's poor and what Christians ought to do about it or what the people of God ought to do about it, and felt like I never really heard anything about it. And... Um, so when I was in college, I, I wanted to go and have a missions-type experience, but um, I, I didn't really want to do anything for anybody. I wanted to actually go and learn and live in the village and take on what I felt like was an incarnational approach. And so when I went to Uganda and Rwanda for the first time, you know, I wanted to, there was a school that I was volunteering at and kids didn't eat lunch during the day and so I wasn't going to eat lunch during the day and I wanted to, you know, sleep in the mud hut, fetch my own water, I wanted to shower with a jerry can, uh, I wanted to sleep next to the cow, you know, I wanted to do it just like people there did and um, it was actually, I feel like, bur the, the out of that, that a deep desire and a deep interest to understand God's mission came about and what God's doing and what does God ultimately care about and how do we actually fit our story into his bigger story um, that the story that I grew up in and I actually you know I'm, I'm always continuously amazed that I feel like the narrative that we live in life is very much robbed by the context and the culture that we live in and I think the biblical story is something that God is always inviting us into and so I wanted to figure out what that biblical story was and how can I find myself smack dab in the center of what God's doing? Okay. Good, yeah. good. So that's a good transition and into, I'm going to jump, jump ahead a little bit into missiology or mission yeah. and hear how you define that. Um, I have a little definition I want to put on the screen yeah. so people can get a feel of that. So if um, here's how a term I want to use. It says missiology is the area of practical theology that investigates the mandate, the message, and mission of the Christian church, especially the work of the missionary. Go to the next slide real quick. And then um, more of a, simply put, it is the reflective discipline that undergirds and guides the churches, and I love that word, propagation endeavors as it advances the knowledge of the gospel in all its fullness, and I want to underscore that word fullness, to people everywhere. Yeah. It's obvious to me that you have bought into this thing. How do you define that? Yeah, yeah. well, I probably, um, I won't have as long of a definition That's as, fine, yeah. as that. Hold the microphone, uh, yeah. You know, one, one thing that I've always thought, though, and I actually said this the last time I was here, was that God doesn't have a mission for his church, but he has a church for his mission. And that, that we actually exist to get on with what God is doing. And ultimately, if I understand God's mission, it, it originates right in the beginning uh, with the Abrahamic blessing. And that you see that God wants to use this family to bless all of the nations. Um, and, and I think if I was to simply, you know, define God's mission, it's that he 
is on this project to reclaim what's his. And, and that involves every aspect and every sphere of what is on this world. Because it's his, and he loves it, and he sent his son to die for it. And so that means human lives, that means human souls, that means economies, that means people who are living in poverty, that means relationships that aren't working. He came to, uh, Paul says in Colossians, reconcile all things to himself, things in heaven and things on earth. So when I think of mission or missiology, it's that, that God's reclaiming that, that which is his. Yeah. Next slide, I, had, I just put some scriptures so you can get a feel in case you're wondering what's the biblical framework and we can make these available for you. So here's a question following up to that. How important then is it for the local church to work with God as it relates to missions? Because I think we miss that a lot of times. Well, it's, I mean, I, I would just say simply it's vital. Yeah. I, I mean, because other, otherwise you, we maybe aren't a, a local church. Okay, okay. Uh, so I think fundamental to our existence is our participation in God's greater mission. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so has everybody knows in the book of Acts, uh, this kind of commissioning where Jesus says that you will go to Judea, yeah, yeah, yeah. to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Are you with me? Yeah. And, and I think that there are two aspects of this that have been really fundamental to me. There's a ge geographical aspect to it. You know, we're going to start with what's closest to us. We're going to move out to the greater surrounding or the nation that we live in, and we're going to go all the way to the ends of the earth. I think there's also an aspect of this, and, and stick with me on this. There is an aspect where, where Jesus, and, and Luke particularly in his, in his works, is challenging ethnic. He's challenging, um, yeah, I'll just stick, stick with that, ethnic boundaries that are keeping us from living into God's bigger vision for humanity. And so when he says Judea, he's talking about the people like you. When he says Samaria, he's talking about the place that nobody wanted to go, those despised people. When he's talking about the ends of the earth, he's talking, he's tying into this story that God has that says every single person on this world matters to God. Yeah. And are we going to live into that? Yeah. yeah so that's, that's what I think about when I think about missions. That Are, are we going to join God in what he's doing because he loves every single person, even the ones that we probably most despise? Okay, so that's what impresses me about you. Um, for those of you that know, he just, Andrew just graduated from Denver Seminary. He's one of our students there. Um, but this is the thing that impresses me about you. When I went to Namayemba, I was blown away. Um, Namayemba is the village in um, Uganda where Eastern, we were. Eastern Uganda. Eastern where we were, right. I did not Nobody, Nobody would know what it is. It's a... Uh, you can't even look it up on Google Maps. Yeah. It would be in a district called Bujiri. Okay. Yeah. So we, we flew some ungodly amount of hours, 20-something, like two days to get there. Uh -huh. And then we get off a plane, got some rest, and we had to drive seven hours. Yeah. Lord have mercy. <laughs> I was ready to come back. Uh -huh. <laughs> seven hours to get to this village. So you get a feel of how remote is it? it is, right? And the thing that impressed me about it is when I got there, what I saw was actually going on on the ground by way of missions. So talk to us about some of the things that as one is doing there, I'm going to flesh that out a little bit. Yeah. 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 So I, I'd say probably th the most simplistic breakdown that I could have is, you know, we have a very concentrated community development approach. And that means that we work in two communities uh, in Uganda, and we want to stick with those two communities. And so when I think 5, 10, 15, 20 years, we're thinking those, place, those places, those people, those communities being radically transformed. And the avenues that we've chosen to work through are education, uh, enterprise, job creation, and farming, because it's, it's the backbone of the economy. But using though, utilizing those in a way that it's not just about creating more wealth, it's not just about, you know, people having more money, but it's also using those as a vehicle for restoring relationships, for raising up a future generation of leaders, and for teaching people and working together to figure out what does it look like to follow Jesus with every aspect of our lives. And so I like to say that we are 
you know, unapologetically combining discipleship and development. You know, in America, we're kind of always trying to remove church and state. We're always trying to remove our faith from kind of the public aspects of life. And we're unapolog unapologetically saying these belong together because you can't do development without discipleship. Yeah. Otherwise, it leads to things like corruption. Yeah. So now, talking English now. Yeah. So, <laughs> sorry. So no, you're fine. You're fine. Yeah. That's good. But but I want people to literally hear yeah. what development and discipleship look like yeah. by way of things like the bakery, by way of things like yeah. yeah. So so if we fall into the, this education category, you know, we have uh, one of our first projects was when we started an elementary school. We have started a second high school that has about 200 kids. We're in the process of or. We have one high school. We're in the process of starting a second high school. Our long-term vision for those is to each have about 400 students. And these are our goal is that they be the top-notch quality educational institutions that are transforming leaders of the future. Nice. And and we also you know scholarship about uh, 120 kids in the country. And so those are kids who whose parents you know live on less than a dollar a day would never have an opportunity to pursue an education. Um, otherwise, and so we really, we really, really deeply invest in these kids, and that looks like working with their families to ensure they have strong family health. It means that they come over weekly for discipleship programming. It means that we host week-long camps where we are deeply investing in these students' lives. I, I, I am much more concerned about what people look like on the other side of working with as one that they would go on to be community transformers they would go on to be change agents and not just the number of people that we serve that do we just do our system so then we run a bakery we run a salon um you know our, our bakery sells a couple hundred pieces of bread every day it employs 12 local ugandans our our salon has uh, five employees trains about 30 women uh, on, on these skills, and then we also run a 10-acre farm and work a lot in the village on training uh, farmers and improving their own practices, fields, and nutrition, and yeah, so uh, doing what we can kind of in those, those communities. How old are you again? <laughs> this is important, right? This is very, very important. Now, where do you find the people um, to, to work these things that are working, that are happening in Uganda, because I want to flesh it out for a little while. Um, and yeah. you're, you're, because we went to do a leadership conference. Mm -hmm. And so where do you find people to do these ministries and to work these ministries? Yeah. Yeah, so our, our first ever employees uh, were some of my closest friends when I lived over in Africa. And so I like to say that they're the founders of the organization too. Um, and we are 100% run and operated in Ugandan by Ugandans. And our, our goal is that they would be the change that they want to see in their communities and they wouldn't have to look at white people for being their saviors. And yeah, that, but, but that they would understand that we are as one, we own this, we are doing this, we are you know, part of creating and building God's kingdom here on earth and, and that they would own that through and through and that we would actually give them that empowerment. Yeah. You know, empowerment simply is just giving people power. And it's, I always get a kick out of when people talk about empowering people, but don't give them things to like access to money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so we are unapologetically empowering local people to do these things. And then we also have a, a, a Ugandan board of directors that runs everything. I'm telling you, it's the most beautiful picture to see. Uh, normally when I go to missions organization, it is ran by um, the white people that started, if I, if I could use that term. And it's beautiful to watch how you will use local people on the ground to run these ministries. Yeah. Now, when I was there, I bump into people that had rough passes, a rough past, a rough life, prostitution, whatever. And you're using them to lead. Talk about that, dude. Yeah. Talk about that. So this might take me a second. Well, you got uh, a second. I'm, I'm yeah. just gonna get, I'm gonna give you a. Story. I wish we had a picture of her. We so, do. Um, Eddie, put a picture up there. Uh, next picture. Let me see. The next one. Keep. No, no, no. My yeah. pictures. My pictures. Got not his. Um, back up to the ones that I give you, and back up some more. Back up. Back. That That's lady her. right there. That lady yeah, right there. Yeah, you knew where I was going with this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, this gal's name is Salama. 
Uh, I met Salama probably four or five years ago when I first started traveling over to Uganda. And in Namayemba, the village that we're working in, right next door is a village called Naluerere. I'll let you guys say that with me. Uh, so in, in Naluerere, uh, they're more or less 70% of the women engage in prostitution on a regular basis. Salama's father passed away. She wasn't able to finish school. She moved over to uh, this village, Naluerere, to work in a bar. Uh, to make a little income. Her goal ultimately was that she would get herself back in school. Well, three kids later and a guy leaving her, uh, that makes it quite hard. And so she, you know, figuring out how to take care of her family, decided to, um, you know, begin, you know, sleeping with uh, several men every single night as, as a way, as she would say when I first met her, she said, uh, to feed my kids. And I remember being, you know, really confronted with that, and I had no resources, no organization, nothing at the time, and just, it really disturbed me, like the whole thing uh, very much confronted what I thought about God, and where was God in the midst, midst of this, and what is God even, you know, maybe asking me to do about this, uh, and, and my thoughts about Salama really stuck in my head for, you know, quite some time. So fast forward from, from that moment um, when Felix was there, you know, over the last several years, I've watched Salama move into this transitional home that we have for some of our scholarship students. This is a 32-year-old mom with three kids. Go back to high school, um, fail some courses, eventually figure out, you know, kind of how to do high school again. Imagine, I don't know if we have any 32-year-old single moms in the household, but going back to high school, how you'd feel about yourself, maybe the shame that you'd carry. Uh, it was kind of embarrassing. You shouldn't be going back to high school with a bunch of 16-year-old kids. Anyway, um, she converted from Islam to Christianity. Got to be, I actually got to be a part of baptizing her. Yeah. I only got a couple of leeches on my leg when we were baptizing her. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, just pretty beautiful picture. And then um, watched her graduate high school, watching her kids flourish in a Christian school, you know, that we even, you know, helped build. And now, you know, Salama's off at college. She's training to become a teacher. And, and she was one of our go-to people for helping host this leadership conference. You know, she doesn't work for us or anything, but she just wants to volunteer. And I got to go on a walk with her, you know, the, a couple days before you came. We went on this long two-hour walk. And she just said, to me, Andrew, I want you to tell as many people about my story because I want people to know what God can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that, when I talk about combining the development and discipleship, discipleship, we're seeing women come out of prostitution who are now like leaders in their community. Um, and that's what God wants to do in all of our lives, I think. Yeah, yeah. Before I, 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 well, let me just say this while I'm on it, because the reason this is striking to me, because that's the vision we have for Aurora, right? Is that we can take people and restore them and get them to where God would have them to be. But if we don't have the developmental side of things, the community development is like we say, get saved and trust God to provide, right? But if a person, I use this illustration all the time, had a former life of being a prostitute and you lead them to God, but you don't provide them with alternatives, what do they do next, right? Yeah. Here, as one is providing people with alternatives, yeah. which is so beautiful for me. Now, let me ask this question. Um, my salvation experience was um, through missionaries, as I said before. The problem with me being led to Christ with missionaries, um, particularly white missionaries, is the issue of being decultured, okay? And what I mean by that, I think we, we have this dialogue, you and I do, is that the white missionary came into my context, and they led me to God, and they planted churches and led people to God. But then you have in the Virgin Islands these churches that are filled with Caribbean people, but they look like white churches, yeah. right? Uh, meaning the songs, the worship style, everything. And the problem with that is now when the church is trying to go out into the community to reach the rest of the community, the church is ineffective because people in the community don't want to look like that. They want to be authentically themselves. How is as one preventing that from happening, if at all, with what you're doing in Uganda? Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good question. Yeah. Um, I would say 
the number one thing that has prevented it from happening so far is that it's 100% run by local people. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you what, like there have been so many little decisions that have been made. This is the funniest things, but about like how something gets decorated yeah. or about the furniture that gets purchased mm -hmm. or about how something looks that, you know, I think, you know, from my culture, you know, I think it'd look better if we did it like this. Yeah. Um, but even giving those small, you know, just passing that forward and saying, um, you know, this is what you love. Well, let's do it that way. You know, this is what you think is beautiful. Let's do it that way. I think this even moves further. You start talking about worship styles. Yeah. I mean, we, if, during our leadership conference that we had, um, and I, I just got such a kick out of this. You know, I feel like in America, we like things to be really, you know, quite organized. And for me, you know, we got this great worship set going on. And then we all of a sudden have like 25 people running up in front on stage because there is good music happening. And when there's good music happening, you know what that means? We're going to start dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and then we got, a ch uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, a little train going around the conference. Everybody's so, joining. Soul train, the, man. Soul train. Yeah, yeah, everybody's yeah. joining the yeah, train. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it would be so easy to like, you know, for me or to somebody to want to shut that down because that doesn't feel like, how I would have done things, yeah. but I think, you know, ultimately it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, and, and, so, and so I am oftentimes torn by the fact that, you know, that's maybe not how I would have done things, but um, I, I have no greater joy than to see, you know, these local, you know, local people, and our, and our leadership is oftentimes comes from within the community, yeah. um, for them to flourish and to blossom and to run things in a way that, you know, ultimately reaches people the most effectively. And that maybe wouldn't be the way that I would have done it, yeah. but um, that doesn't, that doesn't yeah. matter. I'm going to say to you, don't lose that quality. Yeah. That's huge, yeah. Now let's talk about the conference, then we try to segue. We went there to do a leadership conference. Talk about why you chose to do that. Talk about that, what the impact was. So what were you really trying to um, do in Uganda? And more importantly, sustainability. Um, so our congregation get a feel of that, yeah. Yeah. Um, so in Uganda, it's 75% Christian, I think is the statistic. 75% uh, Christian, maybe 20% Muslim. But it's a Christian nation. I think the World Bank recently did a, a study, and Uganda came up as one of the 12th most corrupt countries in the world. And I, to me... You know, it makes me ask the question as to how can those two realities exist? 75% mm. Christian. The president's wife is, um, you know, born again is what they would call her. And y yet we have these staggering statistics about, you know, f corruption. Yeah. And that would be foolish to think that that only exists at the top. Yeah. But that just works its way down into all spheres of how people relate to one another. And I think one of the things that contributes most to poverty, I, I, I'd like to call it one of the giants um, of, of that country and of the, even the local communities, is this issue of self-serving leadership. Yeah. That we're going to use our power, we're going to use our agency for the benefit of ourselves above everything else. And we might serve the community in that process, but ultimately we're looking out for number one. And... Um, that I just didn't, I've never really seen that being the leadership that Jesus modeled in his life on earth. Um, but that power wasn't something to be grasped, but he lowered himself and became human. And, um, you know, I think if we're ever going to make the long-term impact that we're going to have in, in the communities that we work in, these have to be addressed now and over and over and over and over again. And, and so we like to talk about as a team that, that, Servant leadership uh, is one of our number one values, and, and that's countercultural on every level. That doesn't, if you're in Uganda or if you're in the United States. And so um, we wanted to share that message with the community that we work in, and we want to be known for being a people who um, give up our agency or who disadvantage ourselves for the advantage of others. So what was beautiful to me about the conference was that it was not a church conference to say, yeah. is that you had government officials there, you yeah. had 
business leaders there. You had church leaders there that were legitimately interested in hearing what you had to say to begin changing that Namayemba community and to begin impacting Uganda. Mm-hmm. And to say to you, I walked away from that conference saying that change has begun. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. 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 yeah I felt that change has and begun. And that was one of the first opportunities we've had to begin to open up who we are in our culture to the yeah. community that we work in. You know, I mean, we're certain people, but then to begin having these dialogues, um, with government officials, with, you know, people who are civil servants, who, who are working in positions of, you know, high authority, yeah. um, begins to change the dynamic a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, we're running out of time, so let me just say this to you real quick. Yeah. Um, as a church, I'm sold, okay? I am, I am on board, man. I am convinced. Um, what would you say? You going to say something? No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> what would you say to this congregation to get them to become like me? Right. Um, yeah. My commitment, um, you know, to what as one is doing to missions, because that's my salvation story. Right. Yeah. Um, but if a person wasn't brought to God like that and don't have a passion for um, that uttermost parts of the world thing, what does Andrew say to motivate a person to be participate in mission? Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, just for my own sake. You re- can you raise your hand if you've gone internationally or you've gone to Africa or you've gone to Asia on some type of mission experience? So we have some folks in, in the room. Right. Um, right. For those of you who have done it, the thing you've probably realized is that is not necessarily the change that you made, uh, but the change that it had on you and how yeah. it changed you. Yeah. Uh, and, and how it actually, this is my opinion, is when you go, God gets you in on what he's doing. Yeah. And the, I think that there's too many people in the church today, not just here, who don't have that ready posture of going yeah. and joining God on his, on his bigger mission. Uh, and, and so the thing that I want to say is come and see it. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll put you to work. We'll get an activity going. You know, one of the things I was talking to Felix about is we would, every, every uh, three months, we host a camp for our students. It's the same students over and over again. So this, this is a long-term investment in these kids. And I would love to see Restoration, you know, eight, ten people from Restoration come and host that. And come and be a part of it. Come and work with those kids and see, you know, not only, you know, the things that you'll do, but how it will radically change you the way church, the way that you view the world, and maybe what God's inviting you into as a Christian. Yeah. I think that's huge. Here, here is, um, I don't know, this went away on me. I'm going to go real quick. Yeah, here, here is um, my impact for missions, then we're going to um, share, pray, is that I went to Uganda, and I got a chance to see the vision for Restoration Christian Fellowship actually happen, right? You're taking people off the streets, transforming them, bringing them to the Lord, and they're doing ministry. And I ask myself, what is our problem here, right? We who have all these resources available to us impact and change Aurora. So it was very beautiful to watch that happen. And then I think I shared with you as a person of color, um, my experience in Africa was a lot different than the rest of the team, right? Um, because I get there and for the local people, I bring hope to some extent because they see this guy of color that lives in America. Here's some of the weird questions I was getting, and this is the funny part. Kids were asking me, is my, white, is my wife white? Are my kids white? Because here's what they were saying. How can you be black and be an American? Remote villages, right? And, and when they saw me, they saw hope. So imagine what you could bring to people if you can go and serve. If you can go and serve, get beyond yourself, get beyond all the fears, get beyond all that stuff, because it really revolutionizes you. I, I have gone on several missions trips. This one was a little different because I saw our church doing what it's supposed to be doing here. I saw you doing that there. And it motivated me. So I want to let you know, Andrew, we're on board, man. We're committed to do what we need to do. And I would love to see every year teams from this church going over to Namayembas as one and, and being committed. So I, I, I wanted to do this because I want you guys just to, to, to really get the heart, the heart from missions. The world needs you. 
The world needs you. Amen? The world needs you. We've got um, five people that's leaving here to go to Malawi um, at the first part of August. And um, we're going there to do a youth camp. Um, I have to go back with them again. So I want you to live those people in... T- in um, it's three youths. It's um, Stephen Taylor, um, Nate Easley, Edward... Gordon and myself are going to do a youth conference in Malawi, so we're lifting it up in prayer. Um, financial support is needed to make that happen. And the reason I'm pressing the issue of you being 25, um, I'm going to put your business out there. Don't make the mistake of thinking that Andrew is a millionaire. Don't do that. This is a student that just graduated from Denver Seminary, and because of his passion, I think you were 22 years old when you started all of this? 21. Dang, dude, that's even like younger. Andrew goes around beating the beats, the streets, and telling people, work where God is. So you raised all the money to buy over 10 acres of property for that farm, to buy all the property where the compound is. You raised all the money to build all the buildings that are there. You raised the money to build that church that we just showed. You raised the money to build the elementary school where I played soccer. You raise the money to buy the two acres that the high school is on. You raise the money to build the high school. And now you're raising the money to build the second high school. Don't tell me what God can do. He's 25. He's 25. Okay? And you have employed, I'm going to go as far as to say, almost an entire community, man. And 50 people. Y'all not hearing this. Changed their world at 25. He made me feel so bad. I think I texted my board and said, man, I am on fire like it ain't nobody's business because I'm like twice your age plus. Right? And I'm like, if he could do that and God could use him that way to impact the world, what's our problem? Right? That's a third world country where the people don't have anything. There is no lack here in Aurora. Don't tell me what God can't do. Taking prostitutes and makes them leaders. Gang members and makes them leaders. Come on. And they're leading people like crazy. Don't tell me what God can't do. Don't tell me what God can do. Andrew, we're on board, man. I just want to let you know I'm committed. Uh, so I joined your team. And um, I'm praying that God would move people in this congregation to go on board, to go forward. And that uh, we can take teams of people that's going to Namayemba to impact Namayemba. So, so I won't be the next first black, black person that the people in Namayemba see, right? That those little kids out in the villages, they're looking at you and they're looking at me like, wow, what's this guy, right? Who are you? That won't happen no more because you have a church that we're going to take people out into the world. Amen? To be who God would have us be. So I want you to pray for us. I want you to pray that God would move and then we'll talk about what we can do as a ministry. Amen? Yeah, let's pray. Jesus, we pray these words that you would do what only you can do that you would do what only you can do. And you are who our heart desire, you are our deepest longing. And um, even, I mean, for me, for Felix, we get distracted. I know for all of us, we get distracted. We get caught up in the wrong story. We start counting the wrong thing. And God, we just ask that you would draw us back to yourself. You would pierce our hearts. You would break our hearts. You would give us a longing for seeing a world that looks like your kingdom. That looks like a world where there's no more pain, there's no more death, there's no more crying. Poverty doesn't exist. Prostitutes become leaders. Gang members are out there changing other people's lives. That's the world that we desire. And you know, you know where it starts, Lord, and we believe this wholeheartedly is that it starts in us. It starts in our hearts. And so hold a mirror to us. We pray that you convict us. 
and you do what only you can do. And so give us more faith than we could ever imagine. More faith, Lord. Help us to be obedient. Pray these in your son's name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.